Handheld gaming has come a long way. Nowadays, all that fun number crunching is done on a wafer-thin CPU. But how did it get this good? In 1977, big things happened. The Atari 2600 was released, Star Wars opened in cinemas, and toy company Mattel released the world's first all-electronic handheld game, Auto Race. Using only 512 bytes of code, all he did was steer a red LED across three lanes to avoid, well, other red LEDs. But it was a big enough success to get game manufacturers thinking. In fact, just a few years later, in 1980, Nintendo would take its first majorly successful step into the world of video games with the Game and Watch. Each device was hard coded with just a single game. A humble black and white LED screen and just a couple of buttons was all it took to convince us we were diving for treasure, dodging a downpour of tools, or showing Kong who's king. Almost 60 different Game and Watches were made, and over 40 million of these things were sold. And amidst the countless imitations that flooded the market, it was Nintendo who would cook the Game and Watch concept into something far more powerful: the 8-bit Game Boy. Launching in 1989, the Game Boy stuck with the monochrome LCD display, but allowed the swapping of cartridges for a whole library of portable fun. The most famous being the hypnotic block dropper Tetris, a game that's still being released on handhelds to this day. The Game Boy's success is even more stunning when you realise that in the very same year, Atari released a handheld almost twice as powerful, complete with backlit colour screen, the Lynx. But there are reasons why the Lynx failed to catch on. This thing was more portly than portable, with a bad battery life of four hours on six double A's and an expensive price tag to boot. Even so, games like Todd's Adventures in Slime World, with its Metroid-like platform action, showcase just what impressive handheld tech the brick-like Lynx was for its time. Its sprite scaling was way ahead of Mode Seven on the SNES, and you could even turn the Lynx upside down if you were left-handed. Not to be outdone by its rivals, arcade giant Sega pitched in a few years later with the Game Gear. This was Sega's attempt at a portable version of their Master System console. Like the Lynx, it went for a more comfortable landscape shape, backlit color screen, and cartridge format. Here was the thrill of Sonic the Hedgehog, the arcade action of Shinobi, and Sega's own attempt at Tetris, Columns. However, everyone was still enamored with Nintendo's little black and white baby, thanks to an ever-growing library of games. One of which would become a portable phenomenon: Pokemon. Ah, Pokemon, we chose you. And then Nintendo stepped on the gas, upgrading the Game Boy to color. But still no backlight. They were determined to make those batteries last as long as possible. In Japan, more contenders came to the portable party. Neo Geo unleashed their pocket color with a strong lineup of fighting games, and Bandai busted out the Wonder Swan color, boosted by ports of the first few Final Fantasies. But Nintendo would trump everyone again at the turn of the century with the Game Boy Advance, a bigger, brighter screen, shoulder buttons, SNES-like graphics, and backwards compatibility with the original Game Boy. Who could resist? Games like Advance Wars, with its brilliant turn-based strategy, made this a must-have system. Even though the control layout was still hardly different to the Game and Watch. 2003 saw mobile phone giant Nokia try its best to convince us we wanted a hybrid music player, phone, and gaming device. As if that would ever catch on. The N-Gage was horribly designed. A curved keypad. Are you serious? And it just failed to get gamers or developers on board. The Game Boy Advance was still where it was at. And then Nintendo turned around and said, "Would you like a touchscreen with that?" The Nintendo DS finally brought some innovation to the world of handheld gaming after almost 25 years of punching just a couple of buttons. Not just the touch tech, but an inbuilt microphone, wireless connectivity, and two screens. Games like Rhythm Heaven and The World Ends with You, just to name a few, proved that the hardware innovation meant evolved gameplay too. We were so impressed, we even went puppy-eyed over Nintendogs, briefly. And then in 2005, Sony set out to prove that Nintendo couldn't be top dog forever. It was time for one of the world's biggest brands, PlayStation, to go portable. The PSP was a sexy piece of gear. It had the widest screen on a handheld ever, an analog nub, an optical disc format, and enough power to render PS2-like graphics. Everything from the sleek racing of Ridge Racer to the glitz of Luminaires, and even a GTA game in the form of Vice City Stories. 
And yet, once again, it was Mario's Mushroom Kingdom that won out. Nintendo sold double the number of DS's to PSP's. I'll give you a chance. One chance. Oh. But the PSP had still raised the bar. Now we all expected much, much more from our handheld devices. And you know what? Another player had slowly crept into view from a very unlikely source. Apple. The iPhone, launched in 2007, quickly proved it was no slouch when it came to touchscreen gaming. The App Store made it super easy to download new games, and if you were always going to carry your phone with you, why bother bringing a second gaming device when this could do the job? The rest is history. Nintendo's answer to this has been the 3DS, which delivered glasses-free 3D. Pretty impressive tech. But sales have been slow, there just aren't enough games, and after all this time in the spotlight, it feels like Nintendo could be losing its grip. And now here comes Sony with their answer to all this touchy gaming, a PSP on steroids with two touch surfaces and two analogue sticks. Is it really Sony's turn to run off with the handheld handbasket? Only time will tell.